you follow our show, you know that we've visited some beautiful places and had some interesting and enlightening adventures and made some lifelong friends along the way. And I have to say, we don't plan on stopping anytime soon. So as we move forward in the future, I thought, why not step back and take a look at, well, some of those really compelling places and fun things that we've done along the way. Places that really are about my happy place, which is the garden. Well, I bet you can guess where we are today. This is Monticello, Thomas Jefferson's mountaintop estate. Now we know Jefferson in lots of different ways. Thomas Jefferson was our third president. He was the author of the Declaration of Independence. But did you know that Thomas Jefferson loved food? In fact, he's considered America's first foodie. In today's show, we'll venture into Jefferson's vegetable garden a 1,000 foot long terrace where he grew 250 varieties and more than 70 different species of vegetables. I'm over here on the West Lawn. Let's head over to the vegetable garden just south of here. I wanna hook up with my friend Peter Hatch, who's director of Gardens and Grounds. Come on. Now, before we go any further, I want to quickly recognize our garden tour sponsors. A big thank you to Gilbert H. Wild and Son, Sun Patience, Arkansas Parks and Tourism, Ralston Family Farms, and First Community Bank. These tours would not be possible without them. Check out our sponsor page on my website, pallensmith.com, for more information. Well, look at those asparagus beans down there. Yeah, uh, it was another one of Jefferson's fascinations. Uh, he referred to it as a delectable vegetable and passed it out to, uh, to all his friends and neighbors. Uh, I had no idea it. that he grew asparagus beans. That is so cool. Yeah, it was uh, an unusual plant at the time and uh, reflects how, in so many ways, Jefferson was America's first foodie. I, that was, I love that phrase. I mean, he really was. I mean, you look at this vegetable garden and this plot alone or this square, there are five different varieties of very unique things growing. Look at this caracalla bean. Yeah, Jefferson wrote that the caracalla bean um, was the most delicious flowering bean in the world. And I'm not sure he grew it as an edible, but uh, he really aspired to grow it in his garden for its ornamental qualities. Uh, beautiful corkscrew flowers and the amazing fragrance of those flowers. Are, just gorgeous. Are incredible. And, and look at these semblance or, or patty pan squash. Yeah, when Jefferson was in Paris, he uh, uh, asked uh, his friends to send him some simlins or patty pan squashes to show off to his French friends as an example of uh, an American <laughs> vegetable. And he said it was the, um, uh, the most delicious and innocent of all vegetables. He really was proud of being an American, wasn't he? Right, and this was really an American garden in the way he could grow things all year round from all the different parts of the world, including the old world. Um, Jefferson talked about the esculent plants of Europe, and that included the cool season crops like lettuce that Jefferson would plant uh, around this time of year in September for harvesting throughout the winter months. The microclimate of this garden being great for growing things in the wintertime. You know, his diet really consisted of, of a lot of vegetables, didn't it? Right, he said that uh, he ate meat only as a condiment to his meals while the vegetables constituted the major part. Yeah, and, and what do we have here, Peter? That looks like a little pepper. Yeah, it's a Texas bird pepper. It's a wild pepper that grows in uh, southwestern Texas, and Jefferson was sent seed of this by uh, by an army captain who was stationed in San Antonio, Texas. And again, it was one of his great enthusiasms. He passed it out to a lot of the leading plantsmen in America. And, uh, really? It's sort of the predecessor of a modern race of, uh, of hot and cayenne peppers. <laughs> How interesting. Well, this garden does really represent the fact that he, he, he was America's first foodie. Right, he was first in food and first in gardening and, uh, and even first in wine. And uh, his legacy today, I think, is really proud, profound in the way that um, um, he set a foundation for all the things that we're so interested in today. While visiting the home of Thomas Jefferson, I also had a chance to learn about some of the historic plants on the property. Peggy Cornett, Monticello's curator of plants, shared Jefferson's fascinating vision that defined our horticultural heritage. Peggy, it's so good to see you again. Well, welcome to Virginia. It's great to have you here. Well, it's just beautiful, and what a beautiful day. You know, I, what I think is so interesting and wonderful about the Thomas Jefferson Center for Historic Plants is that it gives everybody an opportunity to actually have something growing in their garden that, that Thomas Jefferson had growing in his. Exactly. I mean, that, the whole 
impetus for beginning the uh, Center for Historic Plants was to uh, make actual plants available to people, not just the seeds that we've packaged for years. And so uh, we have a nursery where we're, where we're, we're actually standing, and uh, we grow plants and have plants on display here. Of course, there's a lot of documentation on exactly what Jefferson grew at Monticello, isn't there? That's right. He kept a garden diary. He wrote hundreds of letters about his gardens. Um, he also kept a list of what, what was planted in the garden. And uh, some of the things we have here are quite unique to the site. Um, for example, there is a blackberry lilies that were naturalized at Monticello for uh, decades and they could actually go back to Jefferson's time period and so we've collected seed from that and the ones that we offer to the public are actually propagated from uh, some of the original plants that once stood here on the mountain. Peggy, here in late summer there's so much in bloom I'm just knocked out by the, some of the vines. The cypress vine is just gorgeous. Yeah, that's a great uh, summer annual and you know in a single season it'll just climb up over your house if you let it and uh, it's, it's just a wonderful plant, a very attractive plant for hummingbirds. And well yeah, and speaking of hummingbirds, I mean I noticed how the hummingbirds were loving the salvia coccinea. Oh yeah, that's a real knockout flower and uh, Again, another native plant that atta attracts uh, uh, wildlife, birds, hummingbirds certainly, and bees, and, and um, it's just beautiful in the gardens this time of year. You know, what's so wonderful about the Center for Historic Plants is that you're getting these uh, rare, often endangered plants into the hands of other people so they're shared and, and, and likely not to become extinct. That's exactly right. Our, our mission is to get as much out there as we can to, uh, to get people excited about historic plants, uh, to propagate them and cultivate them and, and preserve them in their own gardens, but it's also helping us. Um, it helps keep these, this living collection alive. Well, I'm particularly proud of what you're doing with old roses here mm -hmm. in this mm -hmm. beautiful example of a old rose garden. It just, I've just become really inspired to even plant more. Well, I'm so glad to, to hear that because uh, uh, the whole impetus of this garden is to tell the, the story about um, uh, rose uh, growing in, in America in, in, uh, in Jefferson's time on into, uh, into the present, really. Um, and uh, Jefferson grew many of these roses that uh, you see here in this garden. And uh, they certainly are important um, from our standpoint because um, they, they really tell an American story of uh, rose breeding uh, that began in Charleston, South Carolina. It's a, it's a great story that uh, has lots of intrigue and fascination. Well, this is very inspiring, Peggy. Thank you for having me. Thank you very much for coming. Elizabeth, every time I come to Monticello, I'm always struck by how Thomas Jefferson designed the house with the, the landscape in mind on, on so many levels. Yes, he absolutely always thought about the house from the very beginning of the design phase in relationship to the landscape whether it was in relationship to the beautiful views of the, of the mountains or the landscape that he himself created on the west side of the house. He loved and was excited by the natural history of this place, North America. He was a constant champion of anything North American, whether it be the majestic scenery or the plants that he loved to grow. And I, I suppose one of the greatest expressions of his interest in natural history is in the entry hall itself with that collection of amazing things. Absolutely. He collected things that really showed the grandeur of North America, whether it was a map showing the Louisiana territory that he had acquired or artifacts, utensils, clothing, and things that were made by Native American tribes. He was very interested in having Lewis and Clark bring back everything they could to show him what was out west. And Elizabeth, if you were lucky enough to dine at Monticello, uh, in the dining room you would have seen images of what North America looked like at that particular time. Well, he's even giving his dinner guest a natural history lesson. He has wonderful images such as Niagara Falls, the Natural Bridge of Virginia, which he actually owned. And of course, here in the greenhouse, we see his love of, of botany and how, how closely he wanted to, to have plants around him throughout all seasons. I mean, this really feels like a laboratory as much as it does a greenhouse. Absolutely. He builds the greenhouse literally next door to his library, next door to his bedroom. It's part of his 
personal suite of rooms. So you had the core of the house, mm -hmm. you had his private suite, mm -hmm. then you move into his greenhouse, greenhouse where he had his little Venetian porticos or porticles, he porticles, calls them. Yes, mm -hmm. right, where he could sit and get the breeze but also have privacy. Mm -hmm. And then from there you and move out onto the terraces. Through his beautiful triple sash windows out onto the terraces. And then from the, the terrace the on into the garden itself and the broader landscape. Absolutely, and the vegetable garden just below. And of course his, his interest and in, in knowledge of plants was really encyclopedic, wasn't it? Truly encyclopedic. I mean, here in this greenhouse, if you think this is you know, 1809 and he has tropical plants like this lantana and plumbago and hibiscus and citrus trees, oranges and grapefruits and lemons. I mean, it's just amazing. Thank you so much for having us. Oh, it's been a pleasure. I have to say it's a real challenge for me to talk about George Washington, our first president, father of our country, and that wonderful 18th century farmer without mentioning his beautiful estate, Mount Vernon. Now have I got a treat for you. Today we're at Mount Vernon, the home of George and Martha Washington, right here on the banks of the Potomac River. Now we're going to talk about food. It's so important to all of us for obvious reasons. And I came here to Mount Vernon because I think it's inspiring on lots of levels. This was a self-sufficient farm in the 18th century. It was a model farm then and it's a model farm for us today. In today's show, we'll talk about the importance of buying and growing food locally, the importance of growing our own food and some tips on how you can grow things for your own kitchen. Now before we get underway, I want to share an astonishing fact with you. In the 1780s, George and Martha Washington in one year entertained over 700 overnight guests here at Mount Vernon. So with that fact, you can understand the importance of hospitality here. The dining room was an epicenter for this. Of course, connected to that is the kitchen, but more importantly, the garden. So why don't we get started in the vegetable garden where all the produce came in for the household. Come on. Look at this cistern. Isn't that a beautiful, simple garden ornament? A simple brick structure. It's about four by six, about 30 inches tall. And the purpose for it in this garden here at Mount Vernon was to bring well water up, which was cold, and allow it to come to atmospheric temperature so you could apply it to the vegetables without shocking them. And here in the vegetable garden, you can see a wide range of the sorts of things that they ate in the 18th century. Apples and figs, as well as a wide range of vegetables from artichokes to cucumbers, onions and squash. Now here, I'm walking along this path. And what I think is so beautiful about this vegetable garden is that it's laid out in geometrical beds. And what you have here is a border of rosemary, which even adds to the distinctive quality of this garden, these bordered beds. On my left, I have cucumbers, and on my right, I have a beautiful bed of peas coming along. I love this idea of using an herb, something useful yet beautiful in this fashion. And what they do is they cut these plants back and keep them clipped into a hedge. Of course, the rosemary stems that are collected are used in cooking. There's nothing better than rosemary and chicken. Now, what they do as the plants die, uh, and inevitably you're gonna lose some in the hedge, they just come along and plant a new plant along to keep the hedge coming along. Now, if you want to grow rosemary as a border or a hedge like this, you need to plant it in a part of the country that uh, doesn't stay cold during the winter for long periods of time. I will say that last winter here at Mount Vernon, temperatures dropped down to zero for about three to four days, and there are lots of really old plants here, so they obviously came through. Much colder than that, I think you'll have difficulty growing it. A couple of other things to remember, shear it. Cut it as often as you like. The more you prune it, the thicker it gets, and the more of that lovely herb you're going to be able to harvest. Second, it likes full hot sun. The hotter, the better. And it needs well-drained soils. It does not like to have its feet wet. Now, if you say, okay, I love this look, but I don't have enough room, try growing it in a container. You can grow it in single pots grouped together, even in a small raised bed, or as a grouping with other herbs. As far as I'm concerned, this is a plant I can't live without. Mm -hmm. 
This is one of my favorite gardens in America to visit. What is wonderful about this, other than its historical significance, is the beauty of the gardens. We're over on the south side of the Bowling Green in the vegetable garden. You know the Bowling Green is that great green sward that sweeps right up to the house, which is so iconic. Now for me, one of the things that's so fantastic about this place is the balance of the aesthetic with that which was utility. You see, this was a working farm. And everywhere you look around Mount Vernon, you're reminded of this. The core part of the garden, if you will, that's connected to the great house uh, was beautiful. It was the pleasure grounds. It was these beautiful vegetable gardens. But beyond, you saw working places places for the nurseries, places for the vegetable gardens, and where all the livestock was kept. Now back to the garden for just a minute. If I could take one plant that represents many of the things I just described, history, beauty, and utility, it would have to be the fig. You see, figs were one of many of the delectable fruits grown right here at Mount Vernon. Now, what I think is interesting about this is that you can see where last year, by the 1st of December, they had cut this brown turkey fig down to here. And what's amazing to me is that since then, since spring, this fig has produced limbs up to three to four feet tall. And you can see that the fruit, the baby figs, are covered all over the new growth. So by heavy pruning, you get lots of new green shoots and lots of figs. Now, I love figs, and I have lots of friends who love figs, but Many of my friends live in northern climates and can't grow them. This variety can grow in zone six, which is where we are now. And they're grown against this wall, which creates a little microclimate. The sun warms up the wall, and it provides a little bit of heat for the figs to live, particularly the roots. So if you want to grow figs, think about planting them on a south-facing wall. You'll want to mulch them in the winter, and choose a variety that's more cold-hardy than others. Now, if you don't believe that taking these little precautions to try to bring figs through the winter doesn't really matter, then think about this. Last winter, the temperatures here dropped down below zero for about three to four days. Now, because of their practices and mulching with a heavy layer of straw, they kept the roots from freezing. Figs are such a fascinating plant. If you go back to the first references of figs, well, they were less about food and more about clothing. Well, I hope you've enjoyed walking down memory lane with me today. We've seen some amazing gardens, but I have to say, we've just scratched the surface. Sadly, we've run out of time, so we'll have to pick up some of those some other time. As we move forward in the future, I hope you'll stay with us and continue to follow the show. There's a lot of exciting things out there to see. Until next time, I'm Alan Smith, and thanks for joining us. If you like this video, be sure to subscribe to my YouTube channel and be sure to ring the bell for notifications.